Good morning. So perhaps I could start by giving you some idea of why in January of 2018, I made the decision to leave the presidency of a 2,000 lawyer law firm and to start the Bass Institute of Diversity. So in a nutshell, when I was president of the American Bar Association, I had the ability to select all kinds of issues of concern to me to focus this 400,000 member organization on. Among the things we focused on was lawyer wellness, why lawyers have doubled the rate of depression, anxiety, and suicide of other professions, immigration reform, a commission on the future of legal education. I could go on and on, but one of the most important research projects that I oversaw was one that focused on why women were leaving the practice of law in droves. Now, most women lawyers would tell you very quickly what they think the reasons are, but what we know is that anecdote does not change behavior, data does. And so this was one of the broadest research projects done to date that looked at lawyers 20 years and more out to ask the women, those who had left and those who had stayed, what had motivated them to make their decision and what their employer or our profession in general could have done to keep them in the profession. It was the result of that study that so depressed me that led me to conclude that I really needed to focus on this full time. I believe we're really at an inflection point. We're at an inflection point because as John said, it's not just about the moral case for diversity now. People recognize that you are not gonna be successful as an employer in 2019 if you're leaving half the talent at the door. And so what I'm doing through the Bass Institute is working with senior management and law firms and in industry to help them better understand why all of their efforts in the last 20 years with diversity committees and women's initiatives have not moved the needle in a serious way to really increase the women and uh, diverse people who are reaching the senior levels of management. So what we know, and much of this is gonna be focused on women, but clearly it covers diverse employees of all kinds. What we know is that women continue to have these unique challenges to get into the upper echelons of business, law, and other professions. And for so long, we have all assumed this was just a pipeline issue. In law, for example, we assumed that now that there was more than 50% of law students were women, that it was just a matter of time before 50% of senior management of law firms would be women. But what we know is that that has not occurred. And so it's really time to consider what are the other causes that are preventing women and diverse employees from really reaching their full potential. So in law, it's been 30 years since women have been 50% of law school classes. In fact, the Bass Institute recently did a conference at Georgetown Law for managing partners of large firms, and the dean said, hey guys, you better get this right because 59% of our 1Ls are women. So we realize that we have this enormous number of women lawyers coming out of law school, and what happens is they get jobs 50-50 with men, and yet, with every higher level, of the echelons of law, there are fewer and fewer women represented. 30% on a national basis of partners, 20% equity partners, less than 10% managing partners. Uh, national Association of Women Lawyers did a study last year among the top 200 law firms. Among the 100 or so that responded, only a handful, a handful could identify any woman among the top 10 earners in their law firm. More importantly, what we see is women departing the law profession at literally 150% of men. So when we start off at 50-50, each passing year, we choose to walk away from the profession. So by the time we're at age 50, we're down to about 26 to 27%. Literally half have left. And what we know is that there are pay disparities and issues with reaching partnerships, even for women who do not have children. Women MBAs, a study at Harvard done this past year, contrary to the assumption, women are not leaving their employment to be full-time moms. In fact, I think 86% said that 
to the extent that they took time out during uh, maternity years, they all plan to go back to work. And yet, if you look at the boomer generation ages 48 to 66, 43% of these women MBAs from Harvard are no longer working, compared to 28% of men, and that the younger Gen Xers, 26% are no longer in the workforce, five times the number of men. Now, you don't need to see the details of this. This is, this is a McKinsey chart, but it just shows the entry level into corporations, which is about 52, 48% men to women, and with each step along the way, the number of women goes down to the C-suite, you're talking about 21%. This is another chart, again, it's more symbolism than anything else, but it shows this is the first promotion to management. And already at that initial step, only 79 women are being promoted for every 100 men. Women in industry have been told for years that there are reasons why we're not as successful that we're not aggressive enough, that we lack desire, that we don't have an appetite for risk. In fact, when I started at my law firm, from day one, I was told, well, you know, women are not very good rainmakers, so you better be a really good technical lawyer. And for 10 years, I heard that every day, and suddenly the light went off and said, who said I'm not a good rainmaker? But this Harvard study went back and showed that many of these assumptions about women's behavior are contextual. And one example was one of the retail brokerage firms that had always heard that women are not good at developing clients, went back and determined that in fact what they had been doing over many years is giving the best clients, the one with the biggest potential for development, to the men. Because they also had been socialized to believe that women were not good at developing clients. And when in fact they went back and made an effort to ensure that the women had as many opportunities to get access to those top performing clients, they did just as well as the men in developing those relationships. Women in academia, there are studies galore about the fact that there are consistent biases at every stage. Hiring, elevation, promotion, peer review, and teaching. And the assumption, of course, is that, oh no, we're academics, all we care about is the quality. And yet study after study shows that when a male name goes on the same work product, it is consistently evaluated more positively than when it is a woman. Everyone believes that they're gender neutral. When I talk to managing partners about pay disparities, they all say, what are you talking about? My daughter's a lawyer, my wife's a lawyer, I love women lawyers, and yet, what we know is that this inherent bias is built into the evaluation process. The assumption that it's everybody else that has a problem is in fact not accurate. What we also know is the good news is most of the disparities are not reflective of explicit bias. You're not gonna be sitting in a promotion review discussion and say, well, I don't wanna elevate this woman because we have too many of them. And yet, what we do know about implicit bias, it is much harder to root out because no one believes that they have it. We all think that we're being totally objective in the way we evaluate people. Implicit bias is unseen, it's hidden, we don't believe we have it, and if we were conscious of it, we would reject it. But the challenge is that we're not conscious of it. But it all stems from the basic premise that we are most comfortable with people who look and act like we do. From the time of age three, they will show, excuse me, six months, take it back even further. If you put six month old babies in pink shirts and orange shirts, the babies interact differently with the children who don't look like them. And this is something that is hot wired into our DNA. Biases are the stories we make up to try and deal with all the incredible amount of information that hits our brain on a daily basis. We consciously would reject them, but there have, there's a whole industry now, a whole science, neuroscience, that reflects that our brains do react differently to people who are different than we are. So 
this idea that we somehow are completely objective in our performance evaluations and our hiring decisions is undermined by what we now know about implicit bias. And in the workplace, what that means is this assumption that we are dealing with an objective playing field when it comes to women and minorities is just not supported by the science. In fact, we impose different challenges when we come to evaluating, elevating, and compensating people who do not look like we do. So one explanation of ex implicit bias that, that I found very useful is think about your brain as a computer, and what you're dealing with on a conscious basis are the apps, but there's this whole infrastructure that you're not aware of, the operating system, that is filled with information that is impacting your decision making that you're not consciously aware of. And one way to think about it is your brain is bombarded with hundreds of thousands of images every day. And the way your brain categorizes it is to create files, files that associate images with particular personality types. So if you see a picture of a 250 pound tattooed white man on a Harley Davidson in a white beater shirt. Without saying one word to this person, you have a mental image in your brain about what his politics are, how, he, how intelligent he is. You, you don't even think about this person individually, and yet you have a whole set of presumptions about what this person's personality is. And if he tells you, well, actually, I have a PhD in English literature, you immediately react because it doesn't fit within that brain file you have. And it's the only way your brain is capable of organizing all of this information. So there's nothing wrong with it, but we have to recognize that when we're looking or evaluating somebody, we are bringing all of this baggage to the process. So I'm gonna give you some examples. I could give you 100, but I probably have about 10 here, about the way these biases impact our decision making. So this is a famous study of a a legal memo was written by five partners. It was given, it was intentionally written with grammatical mistakes, with analysis mistakes, with factual errors, etc. 53 partners from 22 different law firms were all told to review the memo. Half of them were told it was John Smith, an African American law student from NYU. The other half, John Smith, a Caucasian male from NYU. What do we learn? Same memo, the Caucasian is rated 4.1 out of five, the African American is rated 3.2 out of five, the Caucasian is praised for his potential. Yes, he needs some work, but he's gonna be great. The African American, we would never hire this person. Um, he's average at best and in need of a lot of work. What's most interesting, I think, is that Fewer grammatical mistakes were noted in the Caucasian, supposedly Caucasian written, legal memo. So what does that tell us? And this has been repeated in all kinds of different ways, but again, what it talks about is confirmation bias. When you evaluate work product and you have in your brain the assumption about what the person is who wrote the memo, you're bringing certain expectations to your evaluation process. And what we know is that very bright people are really good at this. We can all rationalize our decision making after the fact by pointing to the 22 different mistakes in the memo. When you thought it was a white guy writing the memo, you didn't even see the 22 mistakes. So again, this is something we all have to recognize goes on every time we evaluate somebody. And the important thing is that we know when we do blind neutral evaluations, we get different results. When you don't know the race or the gender of the person you're evaluating, you are likely to come up with a different response to the work product. This is a, a famous uh, example of implicit bias in journalism. This is post Katrina. These are two photos, three days after Katrina, the top one quotes, a young man walked through chest deep water after looting a grocery store. The bottom, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread. Now, what is the distinction 
between those two pictures. The top picture is of African American, the bottom is of Caucasians. Now, I guarantee you the journalists who wrote these captions did not believe that they were being unfair in the least. They really thought they were describing the activity that they observed. Where did these white people find the bread? I don't know. Somewhere in that water, I guess. <laughs> but what it reflects is complete people who believe they're being completely objective find themselves incredibly embarrassed when they actually compare the two explanations. National Academy of Science 2014 study, same exact investor pitch, spoken by a woman, spoken by a man. What do we find? Not surprisingly, 68% of the people preferred investing with the man than the woman. When they invested with the woman, they offered her less money for her project. But what I find most interesting about this study is when they gave money to the male entrepreneur, they talked to him about could he handle success? What would happen if this project really took off? Was he up to it? What did they talk to the women about? Can you handle failure? What if this project never develops? Are you strong enough to be able to stand behind your work? 2012 National Academy of Science study, and this one is used to reflect the inherent bias in STEM studies. 127 applicants for the lab position. Same resume male, female names. Consistently, the men are viewed as better candidates, offered more jobs, given higher money. Now, this has been duplicated literally hundreds of times with African American names, with Asian names, with Hispanic names. Um, what we know is that over time, the percentage of differential has diminished, but it is still material that white men will be hired more often and offered more money with the same exact resume. 2007 study from University of Arizona, faculty position in chemistry. Letters of recommendation. Now keep in mind, these professors who wrote these letters thought they were saying really nice things about these people. These are people who work for them. And yet they described the men in terms of being superb and remarkable implying natural ability. The women are conscientious and hardworking. The net effect is you're making a subtle case that the men have more natural ability. The women are just hard workers. Orchestral auditions, this is one of the more famous ones because of course, despite the fact that for many years there was less than 5% of the five major orchestras in the United States were made up of women, the maestros were absolutely convinced all we care about is the music. How could anyone suggest that we are gender biased? What we want is the best orchestra in the world. And so the response was great. Why don't we start auditioning behind screens? So you don't know the gender of the person auditioning. Immediately, the percentage of women in orchestras started to increase, but it plateaued. And someone came up with the brilliant idea that not just that you needed to audition behind a screen, but that the people doing the audition could tell when the person walked behind the screen, whether it was the clip-clop of high heels or the sloughing of loafers. That without even seeing the person, the mere fact that they heard the high heel in their brain led them to conclude it was a woman and impacted their objectivity in the analysis. It is now the worldwide protocol for orchestral auditions that you walk in on a carpet and that you audition behind a screen. And we're now up to 35% of these five major orchestras are women. Rutgers University study. What we know is that women who talk about themselves in positive terms are considered more capable but less hireable. Men, of course, makes them more hireable. But what's most important is the fear of backlash adds to women's difficulty of self-promotion. And this is something we'll be talking about again in a minute, because we know that women have much greater difficulty talking about the great things that they've accomplished, whereas men don't seem to have that problem. Michigan State study, and this sort of fulfills that, um, women have much greater difficulty talking about themselves positively. 
that they're much more likely to self-limit in their evaluations. In the law firm context, women's self-evaluations were consistently more negative. And what was most interesting is that when women were, um, when women wrote the evaluations for other women, they got significantly more money because I'm much more comfortable talking about you and saying great things about you than I am about myself. Lateral partners, we know, and this is a big issue because there's so much of it going on, that managing partners are much, more, much less likely to accept a woman's representation about her ability to bring business than a man. And so consistently, women are much more likely to raise self-doubt. A man will come and say, I have $5 million worth of business. They're all going to follow me. A woman will say, I have $5 million worth of business. I'm hopeful that most of them will come. And the managing partner's response is, yeah, I get it. I'm going to give you credit for two and a half. Double standard in parenthood, this is not shocking to anybody. What we know is that when a woman comes in to her employer and describes the fact that she is going to become a mother, she is immediately viewed as being less committed to her job. In fact, 67% of women lawyers perceived that the moment they said they were going to become a parent, they were immediately perceived to be less committed to their jobs. On the other hand, when a man comes in and says he is going to be a father, what is the reaction? Great. Now you've got a family to support. You're a breadwinner. You're going to be more committed than ever. Child care emergency, again, not a shock. Women get a 3.5 on the empathy scale. So when a woman comes in and says, I have to leave at 4 o'clock to go to the pediatrician, confirmation bias, the employer immediately says, see, I knew she was going to be less committed to the workplace. As soon as she became a mom, when the man comes in and says, I'm leaving at 4, to coach my son's Corey League team, what's the reaction? Wow, what a great dad. Isn't he wonderful? Likeability, and there's no better explanation for this than the last presidential election. Um, for women, if you are not perceived to be likable, you are presumed not to be competent. For men, you can be considered just an ogre to work for, totally unpleasant, nasty to your employees, but it has no impact on your competence. You can say, he's a horrible guy to work with, but what a great lawyer. Women do not get the benefit of that. Pay disparity. So what we know is every study that's been sh done shows at least a 20% pay disparity. It had narrowed in the 70s, but it has been stalled for years. Women are often labeled as greedy and aggressive and not team players to the extent they complain about their comp. Women in law, we know that the average woman lawyer works eight hours more per week than men and get paid 20% less. There for years has been this presumption, well, that's because women aren't in M&A, the highest revenue generating practices. They're in immigration and health law. Well, actually, the Secretus study compared apples to apples, immigration lawyers men to women, M&A lawyers men to women. The same 20% differential minimum shows up. A major Lindsay in Africa, which is one of the world's largest legal placement firm, did a study last year of big law. Among equity partners in big law, they found a 53% differential in pay. Women in business, a Forbes study of the class of 2012, the average was 22% more that men MBAs made than women. The biggest gap was in management, the lowest in healthcare. But basically what they found is women in the most elite MBA programs were basically paid the same thing as males at less selective schools. This is fascinating to the point about what gets measured gets moved. While 91% of companies track gender representation by level, only 58% track the differential in salary. What we know is that women don't negotiate on their salaries. And in large part, what we know is that if they do, they may get the increase, but they're unlikely to be, have their employer want to work with them. 30% more likely than men to be labeled as intimidating, bossy, or aggressive if they complain about their salary or compensation. Men, on the other hand, are just viewed as leaders because, of course, they wouldn't come back and complain. 
and accept the first offer. What's so interesting is that for years we have assumed that the reason women were leaving both corporate America and law is because of gender balance issues, I mean, excuse me, work balance issues, early years of practice when they decided to have children. That's not consistent with what the studies show. The studies show that women are not leaving because of children. They're leaving for the same reason that the men leave, which is that they don't perceive they have a future and they don't believe they're being compensated fairly. So we know we can overcome these implicit biases and we know that you cannot, you're not gonna be able to compete effectively unless you figure out a way to address it. But acknowledgement that this is likely to be affecting your decision making is the first step. Now, I don't know how many of you have taken the IAT test. If you have five minutes, please, I promise you, it will be life changing. You can find it on Harvard EDU slash implicit bias test. It takes five minutes. It's confidential. More than five million people have taken it. You can test your bias based on gender, ethnicity, religion. You can even test if you have biases toward old people or obese people. But I promise you, realizing that you have, your, have these biases is the first place to start in figuring out how do I ensure that they're not infiltrating my decision making. So how do we deal with it? Obviously, we all know we all have these biases, women as well as men. And so you must start, of course, by recognizing you have it, and then really start evaluating each time you make a decision whether or not you are reacting to some of those biases you have in your head. Um, this just goes to John's point. Lots of studies out there that reflect that the more diverse the decision-making team, the more creative the decisions are likely to be. And we know lots of examples that return on investment by companies that are making decisions by diverse people are likely to have a better return on investment. So what we do know is that training alone is not enough, that you really have to, I mean, tr training apparently will last for about a week. <laughs> um, you need to take the time to question your own decisions and you need to be willing to speak out to others in your decision-making groups when you believe that their decision or what they're articulating as their opinion is being affected by their own bias. But we also know that there are structural changes that we can make. Lots of studies reflect if you do hiring without names, without indications of gender or ethnicity, you are likely to get a better employee pool. The use of standardized questions in interviews. For years, I would have these free-flowing interviews and the candidate would walk out of my office and I'd say, oh, they're great, they're gonna fit right in, which is another way of saying they're just like me. We talked about you know, the University of Miami, we talked about the hurricane. We That's not a basis to be making a decision about hiring. Use of objective performance criteria. Lots of indications that to the extent you can set out specific criteria on which evaluations will be based and you give numeric quantities based on performance and if the woman has an 83 and the guy has a 68, she gets more money despite your inherent thought that but he's got a whole family to support. Um, create targets. No one is going to move the needle on diversity and inclusion without being very intentional about saying this is the goal that I'm trying to achieve and every year I'm gonna evaluate myself against my success in achieving it. Egalitarian solutions. We know women behave differently than men. So one of the examples is multiple studies on if there are 10 criteria for a job, if a man has five, he'll put his resume in and say I'll learn the rest on the job. If a woman has eight, she will say, I'm gonna work really hard this year to get those other two, I'll apply next year. Multiple studies confirming this. So if we put out a promotion and we just leave it out there to anybody to volunteer to submit their resume, what do we end up getting? A whole lot more men in the mix. One of them will get the job and we have then confirmed that first chart of the women not getting elevated from the first position. If instead we say, you know what, I think these five people all have the attributes I'm looking for, I'm going to ask them to apply. You're much more likely to get a better decision. Volunteering for non-revenue generating tasks. We know that women, because that's who we are, will volunteer to be on the Christmas 
party committee or the summer associate committee or the recruiting committee and that's great and at the end of the year when they show up for their bonus review they're told well you have 200 less revenue generating hours and the response is yes but I did this and I did that and they'll say well everybody's supposed to be a good citizen the problem is that the men do not volunteer in the same quantity as men do so one way of dealing with this since we know that this exists is to identify all those people who fit into the category of who should be volunteering and say okay John it's your turn to do this Mary it's your turn to do that do not leave it to the typical personality traits that will dictate unfair results unwillingness to spar with partners we know women will not take on their colleagues to fight about things like origination in the law firm context that's a critical component of compensation so if you simply say go work it out chances are the woman will defer to the man because she knows that if she argues with him she will be labeled as greedy aggressive bossy fill in the blank and it will have long-term consequences so she defers and again it puts in motion a problem with compensation discomfort with self-promotion we've talked about that some law firms are doing away with the annual self-evaluation because they know if purely based on these self-evaluations women will not talk about their successes the same way that men will I, I used to use an example in the law firm context of two young associates at the coffee room they just come back from a hearing the guy is saying wow we hit it out of the park the judge was eating out of our hands it was a great victory and the young woman says what is he talking about neither one of us opened our mouths we were carrying the briefcase for the senior partner all we did was write the legal memo but the reality is that he felt completely comfortable talking about it and taking credit for it and everybody in the room who heard that assumes that he actually had something to do with the result and that enhances his reputation go out of your way to provide opportunities for women we know first of all you're not going to be able to recruit women unless you have women in senior leadership because in 2019 if you don't that is a real red flag for a young woman who's considering options of employment but most importantly having women in senior leadership helps everyone become more comfortable with them being there um, just a couple of quick comments on the me too movement the good news is that all of this recent uh, emphasis on what's going on has created a presumption that we're actually getting better more companies have policies people feel that there's greater likelihood people will come forward and that 72 percent think the chances reduce the likelihood of harassment in the future on the other hand um, most people still believe that these these policies will never be consistently applied that for important men they will never be sanctioned in the same way that people at the lower level will be 55 percent continue to believe that the consequences of reporting are more damaging to the victim and almost 70 percent think that there's going to be a negative impact more on the victim's career than on the perpetrator but this is the one I'm most concerned about and that is that multiple recent studies have shown that more and more men are choosing not to interact with women that may be not be serve as mentors that could be 60 percent in this one say they're uncomfortable engaging in common workplace interactions 34 percent have actively taken steps to avoid socializing with women this one is going to be a real challenge for the next 10 years it's great to be able to root out this problem but if the long-term consequence is that men feel uncomfortable with women because of a fear that they don't know where the line of appropriate behavior is and we'll say for another day whether or not that's an appropriate fear but the reality is if they have it and if it's going to impact their decision making as to who they're going to bring on that plum assignment in st. Louis because it involves a week in a hotel this is a real issue and at another time we'll talk about the potential solutions but in closing we've been working really hard to try and close this gender gap and the good news is the superstars have made it you know the women in my law firm who were billing 3,000 hours a year who were spending 300 days a year on a plane in some foreign land on some M&A transaction they are going to be successful whatever color they are and how many it wouldn't matter if they had three heads 
But what we're looking for is true gender parity, which means that the average hardworking woman can do as well as the average hardworking man. And sadly, the things that I've just talked about continue to prevent us from reaching success. Thank you very much. I do have a few minutes for questions. Fast. I know we were a little behind, so we're trying to make up. Questions from anyone? Good morning. So my question is about mentoring and getting keep, keeping and getting more men involved in the process of what mentoring women. More and more, and I don't think this is news to anyone, mentoring is an important conversation in the workplace. People want mentors. They realize the value to having a mentor. So how do we help bridge the gap between the need for mentoring and the, the fear of mentoring and putting yourself in a vulnerable situation? Okay, two very different things. Um, let's talk about mentoring. Everybody agrees mentoring is a critical part of being successful in any employment environment, helping to understand the ropes, helping with career decisions, hopefully eventually being a sponsor and actually promoting the success of this young person. Um, it's gonna happen best when there's a, na a natural uh, connection between two people, but what we know is that if you really want to imp increase the amount of diversity and inclusion, you need the buy-in of senior leadership. Senior leadership needs to make it clear that this is one of the criteria on which management is going to be evaluated against. And if it becomes part of the compensation, fascinating how it impacts behavior. If it becomes critical, if you think it's critical that people mentor, that has to be one of the metrics on which they're evaluated. How many people that look, did not look like you have you mentored this year and what successes do you have to show for it? Now, the other issue about the concern that the Me Too movement is impacting the willingness of men to mentor, I believe requires an open conversation within the workplace. Because what I like to say is, look, what you've been reading in the paper, you know, like showing up in a towel at your hotel room for supposedly a work meeting with a female colleague, that wasn't okay 50 years ago, and that's not okay today. That is not a reflection of the, the, you know, the standards have changed, and I just don't understand what's acceptable and what's not. <laughs> that being said, um, you do hear, well, you know, I used to be able to say, you look nice today, and now I'm afraid if I make that comment, you're gonna run to HR. Nobody is running to HR. If you see the statistics, women consistently believe that reporting is much more likely to damage their career than your career. So this unreasonable fear that we're running to HR because you said I look nice is unreasonable. Now, if it's legitimate, if that's what the men are feeling, I believe the best way to deal with it is to sit down and have conversations. Open conversations in small groups within the workplace to say, I promise you, if you say something that I'm uncomfortable about, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take you aside one-on-one -on -one and I'm gonna say, you know, you said something today that really made me feel uncomfortable. Please don't do that again. And that's gonna be the end of it. Is there gonna be some crazy person out there that makes a false claim? Yes, of course, that's always possible. But that's not rational. And you can't run your workplace for fear that some crazy person is going to do something that's not rational. Good morning, Anna Wood, MBA 1996. Uh, a, a lot of, when we get people in the workforce, I hire and people uh, leave the office uh, as well. When we get them at a higher level, they have been raised by people who have teach them to be submissive and they project that. So a lot of times it's not the function of the employer or not giving opportunities, it's how we raise our children and that mentality you a female or a male which being Hispanic my parents did not raise us like that so I don't have that approach in life mm -hmm. uh, of looking at myself differently 
But I believe that a lot of what we get is people that already believe that they are not capable, it's not the employer right. doing it, it's not me doing it, and it's very difficult to change a person when they have lived 20, 25 years and been raised like that to change overnight. So the responsibility also goes to the family to ensure that they raising children not differentiating between the boys and the girls, but that they are doing also a good job doing that. Without a doubt, but that's a long-term project. And I, as an employer, want to solve this problem now. Um, one of the things that I used to be somewhat uh, questioning of was these women leadership institutes. Now I do a lot of them. And what I say at the beginning, this is not to turn you into men. That being said, we have been socialized in a particular way. And I use examples from my own 35 odd years in, as a major, uh, in a major law firm. And I'll give an example like, very quickly, you know, for years, I was socialized, if someone comes into your home, what do you do? As a young woman, you offer them something, something to drink, something to eat. For years, in a major law firm, I would have 12 men coming into my conference room, and what did I do? I said, can I get you some coffee? Because that's what I was socialized to do, and I'd be sitting there pouring coffee for 12 men, reconfirming their unconscious bias, and when they needed a pen, who were they gonna ask? Or a copy, who were they gonna ask? It took a conscious effort on my part to say, this is not a behavior that's really appropriate in a male-dominated workplace. So I had to train myself to say, I'm walking in the conference room, help yourself to something to drink. And then the next thing I did was got out of the habit of sitting in the middle of the conference table because as three, four, five-year-old little girls, we would sit in a circle, all wanting to get along, where the boys were you know, running saying, I'm the strongest, I'm the best. I had to train myself to sit at the head of the table because, oh, I'm leading the meeting. Just by sitting at the head of the table, I am communicating to everyone in that room that I am in charge. Sitting in the middle of the table is not helping perpetuate that. So my point is that it would be great if we as parents could instill our kids with these appropriate behaviors, but if not, there are things we can do as employers to help women figure out that some of the behaviors that they've been socialized to have are not helpful in the workplace. I think I have time for one more. Hi, Vili Kuranfalo at Direct the Seeds program for faculty development, diversity and inclusion. So you spoke directly to my heart. Uh, my question, and there's a lot of different efforts along these lines and many people are here. Uh, my question is, what, is your, what are your suggestions in what UN can do more to really bring us to the right place? Well, I'm not going to go through the whole list today, but I can just <laughs> assure you that I, I am working very closely with the president and the provost as well as the deans to talk about things that we as a university should be doing to ensure that we are educating our young women to go in the workplace with all the skill sets they need to be successful because many of them will end up in male dominated fields and they are going to have to figure out ways to try and even the workplace, even the, you know, create the objectivity that does not otherwise exist. So I know we're a little behind schedule. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. <laughs>